Now it, it is clearly one of those situations of I always remind my team and other members in the organization of uh, the innovators dilemma and we have to be able to look at our core product the bread and butter so as to speak and be able to challenge that we all know you know the stories of iconic brands like Kodak and what happened there and so if you're not able to challenge some of the things it's very you know comfortable to not change the status quo but you need to look at the market and this is where you know being aware of the trends that are happening the disruption that is happening in the marketplace and being able to take you know even if it's small steps in the right direction allows you to be better prepared for when big changes need to happen hi i'm dirk molder Founder of the Koala News, I'm coming to you from Wanjuk Noongar country over in Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki, coming to you from Garrigal Land in Sydney. I'm the CEO of the Global Society. And a little bit of news just to get off today's episode. Dirk and I have obviously been collaborating on this podcast on the news section for about nine months. And we were talking last week and we just thought, you know what, it's time to actually call it what it is. And so from now on, the news episode of Global Horizons is going to be called the Koala News, presented by Global Horizons Podcast. How's that, Dirk? Oh, mate, it's good. You know what? It's, um, we've, I've just, it doesn't matter what it's called, to be honest. It's, I've just really enjoyed – I've enjoyed the, the collab over the last nine, nine months. And, you know, when we think back to when we first started, and uh, probably not yourself because you've been doing this sort of thing for, for quite some time, but for me, um, the first one that we ever did, gosh, I was so nervous. And to think that we've now been doing it for nine months and I actually look forward to doing it now and there's no anxiety coming into it. Mate, it's been a, an amazing collaboration and, you know, thank you for, uh, for you know, all your support and your ideas at the beginning. It's really, yeah, it's it's been fantastic. Since we pull back the curtain, I, I think people are probably interested to know how we pull this together. Obviously, you're in the international ed news day in, day out. And so when it comes to producing this podcast, that side of things is basically all you, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I... <laughs> I probably wouldn't go that far. I mean, it's like, it's, a, it's a true collaboration. I mean, yeah, I, look, I probably, you know, I put together a bit of a script and, you know, try and get it to you in, in reasonable time. Ironically, today there is no script, so it's going to be a little <laughs> bit more ad lib. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then, you know, from there you do all the technical stuff and, you know, you're really the, the driving force and the personality behind the microphone and have been known for quite some time. So it's been great to sit at the other side of a computer and watch you do your thing and, and learn from you as I've, you know, kind of developed in this space. So, yeah, true collaboration, right? Definitely a true collaboration. And I think, you know, you read stories sometimes about this stuff and people say, oh, you need to collaborate in your career and collaboration is how you're going to kind of drive projects forward and make the most out of them. But I, I really feel that this has been one of those cases where it's been 50-50 in and like 150% out, if that makes sense. So um, Absolutely. There you go, folks. A little, a little bit, bit of a glimpse behind the curtain. But, of course, the big news for the week is all around the Senate hearings into the ESOS legislation. And on that note, we've got a special extended episode of Global Horizons Koala News, and we're going to dive into detail about that. But, Dirk, perhaps before we get to the rest of the news, you can give us just a taste test a little bit of goodness of what came out of the uh, Senate hearings. A little bit of goodness. Mate, it was yeah, look, fascinating day yesterday. There were nine sessions and the Senate Committee for Education and Employment had a whole range of sector stakeholders from vice chancellors to students to the business lobby to the law council and even wrapping up with the Department of Home Affairs, which was an absolute cracker of a session. Highlights generally are that 98% of people from the sector essentially thought the legislation had massive gaps in it. There are clearly a number of senators that had particular gripes or particular axes to Ryan with the with the legislation. So all in all, fascinating read, and we'll go through that in more detail as Rob mentioned in our special edition. But yeah, look, it'll be interesting to see how this goes. My feeling is that um, by and large, this bill won't move forward in its current form unless obviously the Labor Party roll it. So we'll we'll see what happens. Very interesting. I can't wait for us to have a, an extended conversation about that. And I just want to point out, <laughs> this is brilliant. We record this on a, on a Wednesday. And the Koala, of course, you've just published an article called The Top 50 Quotes from the Senate Hearing. And I've got to say, having just scanned through this, there are some absolutely cracking quotes in there. So if anyone wants to have a bit of a chuckle and to feel 
good about our industry and the sharp intellects that we have amongst us, jump on the Quala News and, and have a read of that article because it's absolutely fantastic. But lots of other things going on in international education. And maybe we can start off with some good news. English Australia announcing its uh, annual award finalists. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you, yesterday when the hearings were on, I think, the email came out to show that the email came out to announce the finalists for their awards. Obviously, their awards are going to be presented in September over here in Perth at their annual conference. Massive congratulations. There's six different categories. I feel like I want to run through them just to give them a little bit of spot, a little bit of spotlighting. Yeah, please, let's do it. Okay, so, um, so I think the six awards in total, the first one's Innovation Award. Shaznana Shinova from TAFE Queensland for Van Doodle Yourself Project. Tanya Dahlenberg, Paula Dimmel and Kathy Watson, the University of Adelaide English Language Centre for their EMI Resource Hub. Patrick Hayat from Scots College for the Pronunciation and Communications course. UNSW College for Mentor AI and Kurosh Langarzada from ILSC Australia for Wire Up AI Enabled GP Chat Assistant Chatbot. So congratulations to those in the innovation category. Next up is Academic Leadership Award finalists. So Grace Fennan from ILSC Sydney, Tony Hickey from University of Sydney Centre for English Language Teaching and Learning Hub, Peter Stojanovic, apologies Peter if I've pronounced that wrong, La Trobe College Australia, Effie Val. Kenis from the International House Melbourne and Alejandra Vasquez from Macquarie University College in Sydney. So that's for the Academic Leadership Award. The next is Action Research Award finalists, and it's Gabrielle as Bill Kuta and Heather Sparrow from the University of Adelaide English Language College, and Javina and Emily. McNamee from Navitas English Perth, Dyla Ibrahim and Brad McClimmer from UNSW College, Lee Morgan and Rachel Hunt from UTS College, Remul Sawa and Liz Stoyanova from Deakin University English Language Institute, Laura Wakeland, University of Western Australia uh, Centre for English Language Teaching. So again, that was the Action Research Award finalists. For the Anne Burns Action Research Grant finalists, Kate Randazzo from UNSW College and the University of Adelaide English Language Centre. The John Gallagher Award finalists were Shizne, Shiz, pardon me, Shiz Hana Chernova from TAFE Queensland and Marianne Wright from the University of Western Australia. And the Christine Bunderson AM Management Grant Award finalists were Lorena Curvo from International House Melbourne, Deborah Lima from ILSC Australia, Maria Naidu from UNSW College, Carla Souza from International House Sydney, and Alejandra Vasquez from Macquarie University College. So congratulations to all of those. I know that was a long list and I do apologise for some of those pronunciations. Always good to get the recognition out there though, particularly for those people who may have been shortlisted but but don't end up winning the award. Uh, I think we need to acknowledge the great work that goes in across this wonderful sector of ours. Speaking of recognition, some great news that came out uh, in the last week or so was Canny being recognised um, in the QS sustainability rankings. Canny, of course, is the Climate Action Network for International Educators, really becoming an important force in global international education in terms of recognising positive movement towards sustainability. And Canny is now partnered up with QS World University Rankings in the sustainability space so that Kenny, the Kenny Accord is now included in QS's ranking methodology around sustainability. I think this is such important recognition for the valuable work that Kenny's been doing over the, the last, God, how long has it been? It feels like six, seven years, something like that. Just continues to drive important change in our sector. So a big congratulations, of course, to, to Elsa Lamont, who's been driving that along with Ainsley Moore and, and the many other people um, around the world who've been involved in Kenny over the years. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations to them. Moving on, ARI, the Australian so the Association of Australian Education Representatives in India has announced the launch of DigiVerifier. Now, this might not sound like a big deal, but I think I actually think this could be a big deal. Um, DigiVerifier is a solution for, uh, I guess, verifying identity in educational documents. One of the things that we hear, particularly out of the subcontinent, a lot of time is around fraud of documents, fraud of identity, those sorts of things. So this has the potential to... I don't want to go as far as say game changer, but if this has the potential to impact significantly and be able to, if we can get a handle on fraud out of that area, I think this is going to be a really, really, really good point. And of course, we have Rohit Sharma from ETS, the Senior Vice President there, uh, on the show just shortly. It'll be interesting to see his take on, I guess, the future of IT in our sector. But certainly, I congratulate Airy for this move and for working, I guess, thinking outside the box in terms of how they can add value to admissions processes and, and not just recruitment activities. So congratulations to Airy on that one. Yeah, excellent. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned 
our, our upcoming guest. I'm super pumped about that. I feel like it's a bit of a scoop for us to pick up a guest of the caliber of Rohit who will join us very shortly. But before we get to that, of course, there's more news. <laughs> it feels it feels like a long time ago now. But in fact, Pi Live was only about uh, a week ago, 10 days ago, at a time of recording. And there were a lot of good takeaways from there. I saw a, a really good write-up by James Martin from Insider Guides, his five takeaways from Pi Live. Yeah, it's great to have James along as a guest contributor. Obviously, James from the Insider Group, if I could think, I think he's trying to stay away from the guides at the moment because he obviously has a number of other products that, that sit within that. But um, yeah, the five takeaways, mate. He really looked, I guess, at um, sector sentiment. So he used a word that I might not want to use on here, but the sector seriously, and I'll just bleep this out, is seriously upset with the government, uh, especially agents especially. They're not convinced the new Minister for Home Affairs will do anything differently. So it'll be interesting to see how that one rolls out. There was a realisation, a realisation, a collective realisation that pursued of growth at all costs the international sector has not done a great job of bringing the Australian community on the journey with us. And I think that's something that we may pick up on in our deep dive into the Senate hearing. Caps, obviously, there's a bit of anxiety around caps. I think there's a little bit of miffness around how caps and housing are linked. Again, a, a very astute observation there. Just on caps, I did notice an article from Tracy Harris in the Quire about uh, you reporting on Andrew Norton's recent paper that just dropped, um, saying basically caps, terrible idea, do not do it. And um, we've reached out. We're hoping to have Andrew Norton on the podcast possibly early next week. Yeah, looking forward to that one. Yeah, so then look, the, the last two are feeling the pinch. So they're clearly service providers that are attached to the sector uh, are obviously feeling the pinch. I know, you know, probably you may say the same thing. People say to me, isn't this a great time to be in the news cycle or in the news business? And it is for content. You know, it's great. It's keeping me really focused and busy. But the thing also when things get like this is that institutions and service providers start tightening the purse strings and that makes it more difficult to remain financially viable. So so definitely I think there's an acknowledgement around feeling the pinch. Uh, students, James's point, he refers to the Allianz State of Student uh, Healthcare Report, looking at students being hungry and isolated. Fruit is the first to go, according to Tara Day Williams from Food Bank. There's five takeouts from James. Again, the pie live, everything I've heard has been positive about it, but it also must be conference season because the Times Higher Education Campus Live ANZ has been announced and that heads to Newcastle this year, which is interesting. I think it's been at the University of Sydney for the last couple of years. That will take place in September, I believe... 26th to 27th of, of September, and in a collaboration with the Times Higher Education, um, readers of the Koala News can actually access a 20% discount on their registration. So if you go to the Koala News and look for the Times Higher Education story, there will be a link there, and if you use the code Koala20 on your registration, you will receive a 20% discount. Well, well, you've done a really great job on that one, Dirk. That's a cracking deal for readers, and I'm on the uh, page right now. So yeah, if you just jump on the Koala News and look for the campus live you're going to find it it was published on the 31st july so go do it actually while i was talking about media i just wanted to give a shout out to tim dodd from the australian who is retiring for those who know or who've been reading the the australian's higher ed section he's been one of the pillars of that publication for a long time so taking his well-earned retirement but the sector does lose a voice in the mainstream media in that regard. Our acknowledgement to the fine work that he's done over many, many years. Agreed. It was quite funny because I shot Tim a, a note on LinkedIn. And, you know, it's really funny. And, I, you know, again, a podcast is a great medium to be able to let people see or hear the feeling of some of these things. I'm not a trained journalist. And so for me to be in contact with someone like Tim Dodd, who, you know, I've been reading for, for many, many years myself. And I've reached out and I just wished him all the best. I wasn't sure. I, it was early on. So I just heard a, heard a, a whisper that he made been retiring and to get a, a really complimentary note back says a lot about the man and I am um, you know I, I was absolutely chuffed to you know the note came back as as almost like we were colleagues and yeah completely chuffed to think that somebody of that stature actually even acknowledges me and acknowledges the work you and I and, and others have been doing in independent kind of spaces it was a real yeah it was a really really nice thing maybe after he gets bored in retirement a little guest slot on the koala <laughs> I don't mind saying I did suggest that, uh, and he, he 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 did say that he was going to take some time out before coming back to anything. <laughs> very good, very good. Last thing, maybe before we we bring in our guest Rohit Sharma from ETS. Of course, there's the major announcement recently about ministerial reshuffles, and that's the Australian Labor government. It feels to me like they're starting to get themselves ready for the upcoming election, but some pretty big changes there, Dirk. Yeah, absolutely. So look, the, the headline, I guess, from our perspective is that Claire O'Neill's been moved out of home affairs and moved into housing. Tony Burke, who is a 
long seasoned Labor Minister and someone who has a significant voice in the cabinet room has been moved into Home Affairs. He also brings with him the immigration portfolio, which where Andrew Giles has been moved out of and has been moved into training on the back of Brendan O'Connor's retirement. Interestingly enough, training now sits out of cabinet. So the dynamic between education, the education minister, Jason Clare, and a what is now seen as a junior minister in Giles uh, heading up uh, skills and training will be an interesting dynamic to watch over the, over the next little bit. But yeah, you're absolutely right. The deck chair's move is signalling, obviously based on the back of a couple of retirements uh, out of the parliament, Brendan O'Connor being one of those. Interesting to see those moves. What I found really fascinating is in mainstream media that O'Neill's performance has not been judged on what's been happening in the international ed space at all. Again, it's been about boats and it's been about other issues in migration. Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely miffs me to the point where international education as a fourth largest sector in Australia now still doesn't seem to get the airplay that other sectors do. And even within migration sort of realms, it just does not seem to get the airplay. Interesting times. I think we're definitely, we're still making traction. But, um, you know, again, all all the commentary has been about our borders rather than international students. So interesting. You can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, get insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at AIEC.idp.com. All right, Dirk, should we bring in our guest? Mate, sounds good. It is our absolute pleasure to have Rohit Sharma, uh, Senior Vice President at ETS, join the Global Horizons and Koala News News podcast. Rohit's been travelling around the country for the last week. He's just been telling us uh, prior to our pressing record on this. Welcome to the podcast, Rohit. We look forward to, to hearing about your journeys. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me, Dirk and Rob. Look forward to it. Excellent. Mate, prior to pressing record, we, we had a bit of a chat. What have you been up to for the last week? I know, um, I think you're at the at the Pi Live event over the last couple of days, but give us a little bit more of a background. What have you seen of Australia in the last week, mate? Yes, so for work-related, I was in Melbourne for the IEA uh, Transnational Education Forum uh, last week. And then earlier this week, I was at the Pi Live on the Gold Coast and then uh, had a chance to meet with some industry stakeholders yesterday night in Brisbane over dinner. And then now I'm in uh, Sydney. So doing the Grand Australian Tour. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, when we were talking earlier, also managed to squeeze in a trip to Uluru. So I feel fortunate to have been able to visit that. That is incredible. I know in previous conversations I've had with Rob and, and you know, Rob and I have been friends on Facebook for quite some time. I've seen numerous photos and stories come from Rob around Uluru and I know it's a very special place in his heart. So, uh, mate, it's, it's amazing. Not many Australians have probably have ventured out as, as far as what you have. So congratulations. Yeah, no, thanks. Out of curiosity, what was your, what was your impression of Uluru? Magnificent, if you ask me to put it in one word. Uh, just the sheer scale of it. Uh, you obviously... Always look at it on the internet in pictures, but once you're there, and especially up close, uh, just the scale of it, and it's quite vertical. I don't, you know, you don't realize that till you're up close to it, and so it's fantastic. And obviously, the the way the colors change during the day, especially during sunset, uh, becomes almost close to red. That was just an amazing experience. Oh, that's brilliant. Ro, one of the things that we love to do with our guests is talk a little bit about the backstory of how people get to where they are. And we've had you know multiple guests over probably the last six months or so now, Rob, and I ask you the same question. You're a Senior Vice President at ETS. It's a great title and obviously a, a role with significant responsibility. How does someone get to that role? And can you kind of go back maybe you know, a little bit in your, in your past career history and, and walk us through how, how that comes to be? Sure. I would say two words, international education, which is quite relevant to what we are talking here, uh, has, has been a key enabler for me to do that. So just as backstory, I uh, grew up in India, uh, had my formative education there, went to high school there, as well as did my undergraduate, uh, but then had the opportunity to live and work in India as well as Southeast Asia. But then I was looking for more global options for myself uh, and thought an international education would be 
a key pathway and enabler to do that. So I took the TOEFL myself a couple of decades back <laughs> and made my way to the US uh, for my master's. And uh, since then, have had different opportunities, had some roles in the travel sector before moving to the education sector. And then uh, roughly 15 years back, uh, made the move to the education sector across different parts of the education spectrum from traditional higher ed to corporate training to alternative credentials. And now with the ETS, uh, a talent education and talent solutions organization that's awesome that's an incredible story i might just drop in i i've spent quite a bit of time in india myself so uh can i say uh hindustan up <laughs> that is quite good uh and i will translate that i am from uh, grew up in a town called jamshedpur which is on the eastern side of uh, the country near calcutta uh, roughly 200 kilometers west of Calcutta. Ah, Pahot Parea, which means very excellent. Yes. That sounds awesome. Unfortunately, I don't speak any Hindi, but I, I do speak a little international education, so I'm going to turn the conversation <laughs> back to my familiar territory. It's been it might be a few years, obviously, for, for international education with COVID-19 and the like. What are some of the big global trends that you folks are seeing at, at ETS? Yeah, Rob, look, I think obviously COVID-19 put uh, a dampener on that, mainly because international mobility is also equal to physical mobility, right? You know, historically pre-COVID, international mobility has been a lot about students moving physically from one country to the other. And I don't uh, foresee a big change in that, at least in the short to midterm, uh, though COVID did provide that alternative modalities to become much more mainstream. So online education, hybrid education, not just for international students, but across the board, became much more acceptable, became much more mainstream. And so while the actual flow of students moving from one country to the other obviously took a big hit during COVID, numbers have rebounded uh, across the board. And I think that's, that's what is exciting about this sector, that if you go back even a couple of decades from the 19 you know, 70s, uh, when there were less than, you know, a million students globally uh, studying to, you know, it's expected to hit 9 million at the end of this decade. There's only one way this industry is going and that's up and that's all related to the uh, dynamics of supply demand that is there. I do have a question off the off the back of that. I mean, you'd be aware of some of the big changes that have been happening here in Australia. We've had a really turbulent year here with government cutting the number of students getting in visas and all the kind of policy changes around caps what's your sort of perspective as an external provider but that's heavily you know um, involved in the area what's your perspective on what's going on here in australia australia is witnessing is what i would say a temporary correction i would put it in that category like many other industries what ends up happening is you know, when COVID hit, in, in the case of Australia as well, students couldn't come on show. There was a pent-up demand uh, across the world for, you know, continuing to pursue international education. And as the borders opened, uh, perhaps, you know, at some point, certain government policies were too lax, unintended consequences of any such thing that happens. And a lot more students came in and that created some, you know, again, unintended consequences uh, in the sector. Any sector that sees growth, whether it's education or other industries as well, there's always a bunch of bad actors in those industries. And, and what ends up happening is those bad actors then, you know, potentially spoil spoil the market for everybody. And I think uh, what I'm observing is the government is reacting to some of the unintended consequences Uh, of what happened as part of the growth, as well as some of the actions that were taken by bad actors in terms of whether it's students' exploitation or, you know, taking advantage of the visa categories that were there of shifting students between institutions, which is not the intent behind, you know, any of the educational visas uh, that are there. So I think right now, what my observation talking to stakeholders is there's a temporary correction that is happening as the government is also thinking about what are the next steps that are going to be taken, some of which have been announced and others are being contemplated. Actually makes me a little bit reassured, to be honest. That's probably the nicest take on it that I've heard. You know, it's one of those things, we're we're, we're inside it, so we kind of feel, we're inside the can being shaken around. So it's interesting to get that perspective from outside. It actually makes me think, oh yeah, good. Yeah, maybe things are going to settle down (laughs) once the correction passes. That's so true, isn't it? Like things grow industries grow and then sometimes there's a correction and 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 then things settle down and 
you're back on track. Yeah, I really think Rob's point earlier about that growth from, you know, 1 million to 9 million global mobile students, and it's going to continue. Forecasts go beyond that. So when you start thinking about it in those terms and that temporary correction, as you mentioned, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Very reassuring. Yeah. As you mentioned about being in the can, uh, the analogy I often draw is if you look at the stock market, uh, uh, what people inside Australia are witnessing is what I call intraday volatility, right? So when you are in it, there's a lot of volatility, but if you take a step back, um, it, it should move in the you know in the upward direction. It's a good a good analogy. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's kind of focus a little bit more on some of the work that you've been doing lately. The TOEFL test obviously has gone through, uh, I guess, some iterations over the last 12 months or so. That has caused, I guess, some issues here in Australia where it, I guess TOEFL was not recognized for a period, but it's now back, which is good. Can you talk us a little bit, talk us through some of those methodologies and I guess some of the rationales for some of the changes that have been made in the TOEFL test over the last 12 months? Sure. The big change that we made was essentially in response to the feedback we were getting from from test takers, which is which are the key stakeholders of how do we make the testing experience much more less uh, so that it's less stressful, less anxious for the test taker. And so we went back and looked at years of data around our test, which was close to three hours before we made the changes. And one of the things that we did was based on statistical results that we saw how different item types behave, we were able to then look at how do we condense the test and make it shorter. And so we were able to bring it down to less than two hours while maintaining the same level of reliability and validity, which is the benchmark and the key thing to look for in any assessment. And so as we did that, we made sure that stakeholders, including the DHA, was aware of those changes and they wanted to evaluate that to make sure that it still has the same level of reliability and validity. It took some time, but uh, glad to share with everybody that we are back uh, and accepted for all visa classes uh, for Australia. So happy to report that. I think it's fascinating, right? Though this is where being a bigger organization has so many advantages because you've got so much data that you can then go back and look through and analyze in order to make changes. So you can be very methodical about those changes. I've, I've run small businesses for the last 15 years and invariably that's one of the challenges you run up against is you're not sure what a particular change, what impact that's going to have because you just haven't, haven't done it before. You haven't got that data behind you. But, you know, the big organizations have that data. So when you go and look at it, it gives you an opportunity to to make sensible changes based on real evidence. Absolutely. And that's what, you know, our, our team of research scientists as well as our psychometricians were able to point us and say that, you know, even by reducing the length of the test, we are able to maintain the same level of reliability validity. And that's what matters at the end of the day. Dirk, I will feel like I've succeeded once I've got a psychometrician on, on board on my staff. Yes. <laughs> It's almost like the dream. <laughs> almost the dream. Definition of success. Well, it's, it's fascinating, right? You know, so much stuff comes down to psychology and data, and data doesn't lie. So, you know, I, it, it literally is a dream of mine to have that kind of person on staff that can dig into that and, you know, reveal these insights. <laughs> I can see a collaboration coming up with you and Kerry Ramirez. There we go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Look, we are very proud to talk about the fact that as a company, we believe in the science of measurement. And that's what backs all our products and solutions that we offer to the marketplace. Because once it is backed by the right research, we can put our stamp, we can put a stand behind it and say a particular measurement, in this case, an English language assessment is actually doing what it's supposed to do, measuring a student's readiness for being productive in an English speaking academic environment. And that's what you know, TOEFL does. I'm just thinking out loud now. When when you make changes to these tests, and, and obviously we've seen here in Australia, there was, uh, I guess, some time taken by the DHA to evaluate that. When you roll that out globally, do you have, I guess you do have different regulatory environments that you need to take into account. Can you kind of peel back the contact paper for, for the want of a better phrase? How do you start going about that when you start thinking about making changes? So obviously, you know, you're going to look at your major markets and they're going to be probably the UK, the US, Canada, Australia, but there's going to be so much more out there globally, particularly from test centers and, and sending destinations as well. I, I don't even know where to begin with, with that question, but how do you start that process in terms of kind of conceptualization of a change to implementation? 
given the complexity of a global environment. I mean, it's it's incredible. No, it is a, uh, it is a complex, uh, but a very methodical process. We always start with, at the end of the day, the customer uh, or the test taker in mind, while making sure that at all points we keep at the background our other stakeholders, as well as any kind of compliance that we need to adhere to. So our other stakeholders is obviously institutions that accept these tests for admission purposes and any kind of regulatory regime, in this case, Australia and DHA, we want to make sure that we are adhering to any kind of compliance requirements related to that. So once you start with that kind of a framework of understanding what the end user is looking for, and that's where product market fit, you may have heard this term used oftentimes, comes into play where we evaluate not just you know what the customers are demanding where the market is moving but also what the competitive environment is based on all of those factors we want to we bring those back uh, as requirements into our team who then evaluate what can be done based on the inputs that we are getting from the market and market is not just the test taker market is the agent market is other educational institutions market is the accepting institution each one of them may have slightly different requirements um, you know, for, for a test taker, as an example, they would want, you know, can we do it in 15 minutes, ideally, if possible, if possible, but at the same time, we need to balance that requirement or that uh, desire with what institutions are looking for, which is a valid and reliable assessment for the purpose and the use case in this case being, you know, being able to operate productively in an English-speaking academic environment. And so you take all of those into account and put that as requirements. And this is where you need to have the right set of team uh, team members from a product perspective, from a research perspective, from an assessment development perspective, from a psychometrics perspective to come together and give you know, provide the options that are there for us to consider. And we then evaluate the pros and cons of doing that and eventually make a call based on that. In many cases, you are you know, creating prototypes uh, uh, and and concept papers that you are then validating with stakeholders, making sure that before you do a lot of investment, you are on the right track. And once you get the feedback, you may need to tweak some things and then you uh, start to develop and then eventually implement. And part of the implementation also requires making sure that the market is strained on that. So we want to make sure that when we are making these changes, we are informing our stakeholders, which are the institutions, creating webinars and trainings for them, understanding what changes were done. Same thing for our agent community, same thing for you know individual test takers. So there's a whole lot of things that go behind it, but there's a method to the madness, as they say. Out of curiosity, what's the sort of time frame on a major change like that from end to end, give or take six months? <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the size of the change, it could even be as longer, up to a year. But some of those changes are more easier and quicker to be done when you're not touching the core assessment. These are much quicker. In many cases, as an example, when you think about the product, the product today is not just the assessment. The product is also other things, our experience uh, from a registration standpoint. How do we make that simpler and easier? The product is also the student's ability to pay in local currency, as an example. The product is also out what the experience is during the test in a test center or if they are taking in online. So the product has so many elements to it. And depending on the type of change you're making, whether you're touching the core assessment or other things around it, the time that uh, is required depends on that. What do you think, you know, because there's such a trap for big organizations that have had success, some success, you know, to sort of not touch something that's that seems to be working really well. But clearly, ETS is, is an organization that's entrepreneurial, it's looking at opportunities, it's happy to make changes. How does the organization sort of encourage that sort of culture and behavior, if you like? Because, you know, big organizations don't necessarily move fast and, and can be quite risk averse. I was going to say that's it. That risk adverse was the, exactly the term that I was going to say. Yeah. No, it, it is clearly one of those situations of, I always remind my team and other members in the organization of uh, the innovator's dilemma. And we have to be able to look at our core product, the bread and butter, so as to speak, and be able to challenge that. We all know, you know, the stories of iconic brands like Kodak and what happened there. And so if you're not able to challenge some of the things, it's very, you know, comfortable to not change the status quo. But you need to look at the market. And this is where, you know, being aware of the trends that are happening, the disruption that is happening in the marketplace and being able to take 
you know, even if it's small steps in the right direction, allows you to be better prepared for when big changes need to happen. So we have adopted that and it's an ongoing thing in any organization, encouraging people to take risk and then not quote unquote punishing uh, when risks don't pan out. Uh, I think it starts from the top and needs to trickle down to all parts of the organization. That's a really important point. I mean, there's so many corporate environments where those risks when the, or, or when things don't work the first time, the people are punished for it and it creates a culture of, I guess, non-entrepreneurship and people being really careful in the way that they, they move as opposed to thinking outside the box and, and creating that innovation space, as you say. So I you know, tap my hat off to, to the culture that, that's being built there because it's to, to be able to manifest that is really, really important and to be able to live it is even, even more important. And we are just a 77-year-old young company. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Well, if we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, if we talk about innovation in, over the last 12 months, what do you see as being, I guess, the main thrust of innovation over the next, I don't know, say three to five years? Obviously, we have AI coming on board. We've seen some of your competitors uh, move into a more digital space and being able to, to take home or be able to be done by, via computer um, more at home. Regulatory bodies probably aren't quite there just yet on those things. How do you see the next three to five years panning out in this space? Definitely, AI is going to play a much bigger role. The core, of, especially in the last 12 to 18 months, generative AI is one of those things that has so much direct impact on an industry like us. If you think about uh, an item creation, when we create an item that is assessing a certain type of skill, whether it's English language speaking skill or writing skill or listening skill, or even non-English language, these are quantitative skills that you're testing. There's an ability now to generate those items at scale at a much more, being much more cost efficient. Models still need to be fine-tuned, but as you, as we've talked about taking the next three to five-year view, I think that's going to become much more affordable and efficient. That also means that at the end of the day, it will allow us to offer products and services potentially at a much more attractive prices to consumers and consumers uh, that are able to take benefit and advantage and pass on us as an organization, passing on some of those savings back to the end consumer. So that's one thing that's definitely happening, the uh, AI. AI is also going to play a role in terms of increased personalization. You know, the the holy grail in education is all about, you know, personalization of education pathways. You know, rather than a class of 20 people, if I could have literally a teacher to everybody, but nowadays with, you know, again, things need to be refined and perfected, but AI tutor, as you are preparing for these assessments, can you have individual coaching? That becomes important. Obviously, not everybody can afford to have individual tutors, but AI makes it much more affordable. The ability to practice with someone one-on-one, -on -one, your uh, spoken English as an example, becomes very important. Looking into pronunciation as an example becomes very important. So these are things AI is going to help in so many different ways that uh, we are incorporating it in, in all aspects of our assessment development, test prep that we have, uh, creating personalized learning content based on what are which areas you may need to improve upon. So that's one. The second is we also feel as we look forward the next few years, uh, non-cognitive skills, Dirk and Rob, as we think about, are going to also become increasingly important in addition to cognitive assessment. So what I mean by that is obviously institutions, when they are admitting students, they want to make sure international students have the English proficiency. But in many cases, you're also looking for your quantitative reasoning, your verbal reasoning ability, so that you're able to operate effectively at a higher education setting. But at the same time, as you think about, we also increasingly education institutions also, besides employers, are asking, how do I make sure that the incoming student or the incoming cohort has the right mix of people who bring their traits and skills of leadership, of critical thinking, of communication, of collaboration, because that's what eventually real life is going to be once they graduate and work in a for an employer or for themselves. And so we are also creating assessments that can help measure these what we call durable skills and make sure that individuals are able to you know beforehand at each point in their life journey what is their level in each of these skills and then work to improve upon them. Assessment shouldn't be just about, you know, you're in or out. Assessment should be 
uh, about making sure that you have the right signal to understand where you stand on a particular measure and be able to improve upon it. So those are two things that I feel we'll see happening more so in the next few years. It's incredible. The mind boggles. We often talk about AI in the future on this podcast, and you've just given some great examples as to how we're literally looking into the future right now and seeing you know, what our children will be growing up with. And you know, when they graduate high school, some of the, the personal tendencies that they might have and being able to measure those, it's, it's incredible. It's something that we probably didn't grow up with, and, and it's all, all available because of AI. It's incredible. We view our role increasingly at ETS as making sure that we are enabling all of us and we consider everybody today to be a lifelong learner, to be future ready. And you can be future ready only when you have a starting point and understand the skills that you have today and where you want to be and how do you bridge that gap that might be there. And so assessments are a great signal that way to uh, enable you to understand all of those factors that can help you make successful. Robert, before we uh, wind up, can you maybe just give us a little picture as to how widely accepted TOEFL is in Australia and how that may stack up against other countries around the world? Yeah, TOEFL is accepted by every Australian institution for admissions purposes, as well as accepted across all visa classes in Australia whether it's the 485, whether it's the 500. And uh, one of the things that in addition to that, TOEFL is accepted by 13,000 institutions around the world. So it is the most widely accepted English language assessment in the world today. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Dirk, everywhere, everyone. (laughs) Everywhere. (laughs) Absolutely. Actually, before we go, social question. What else have you got on your social itinerary before you head back to the States? Uh, Not much time left for social (laughs) itinerary other than a bunch of meetings tomorrow and day after and then heading back uh, in between trying to squeeze in if I can uh, meet some, uh, you know, old friends who happen to live in Australia now. Fantastic. Well, we wish you luck and thank you for joining us on the Global Horizons Koala News News podcast. And we look forward to uh, hopefully having you back on one day and hopefully coming back to Australia. Yes, and I look forward to it. Thank you, Dirk, and thank you, Rob. Great to chat, bro. Here. And for those of you listening along, of course, thekoalanews.com is your source of news for Australian international education. If you're not subscribed, then you really must be, thekoalanews.com. And once again, great chatting, Dirk. Thanks again for all your work keeping us up to date across the industry. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. See you next time. Bye for now. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.